This is the last lecture in GIT. We'll be discussing digestion and absorption. Okay. So I hope we'll be able to finish. Otherwise, some of the information you'll have to go and start on your own. This slide is displaying different type of food that we normally eat, and it contains different types of macromolecules that will be digested in the GIT. So you can see we have bread, potatoes, a lot of starch, and then there are fruits here that will contain a lot of vitamins, minerals, and other macromolecules. We have fish, meat, eggs. These they contain a lot of proteins. Then we have dairy products that will contain a lot of uh, fats and also proteins. So from these different types of food, we obtain different types of macromolecules that the body requires for survival. Okay. Yeah. So introduction to digestion and absorption, the breakdown of large food molecules to chemical building blocks. So the main reason why we are digesting, we want to break down the large food molecules that we are eating into chemical building blocks, which are called monomers. Monomers are the ones that can be absorbed by the mucosal cells. So the mucosal cells, they don't have the capacity to absorb larger molecules. So they have to be digested into the building blocks, which are called monomers. And these monomers now will be absorbed. So these are the type of substances that can be absorbed by the GIT itself. So there are channels that are responsible for absorption. So those channels are the ones that we'll be discussing today. So the breakdown is accompanied by enzymes from glands of GIT. So from the gastrointestinal tract system, of course, there are a lot of glandular cells that are producing enzymes. Remember, we said from the pancreas, from the stomach, from the intestines, there are a lot of enzymes that are being produced there. Then they'll be secreted together with the secretions into the GIT. So those enzymes are the ones that are going to be breaking down the molecules into the monomers that will be absorbed by the mucosal cells, okay? And absorption is facilitated by the uh, microvilli, which are more like finger-like projections that will increase the surface area for absorption of these molecules. So there are four main food substances that are required for life. So we have carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, these are different types of uh, food substances that the body require for survival. So we need to be digesting these and absorbing them. There are certain food substances that we, we don't have the enzymes that are responsible for digesting them, like cellulose. So you find that even if you eat cellulose or plants, it's very difficult for you to digest some of those things that are coming from the plants. So hydrolysis as means of breakdown. So sometimes there are certain en enzymes that to use water to break down molecules. So they are using water to break down molecules. So carbohydrates break down from polysaccharides to disaccharides and the final breakdown is monosaccharides. So the larger molecules of carbohydrates, they are referred to as polysaccharides. So those polysaccharides, they need to be broken down into disaccharides. Disaccharides is a combination of two monomers. So it could be glucose and fructose, or maybe glucose and galactose. So they need to be broken down into the monosaccharides. The monosaccharides are the ones now which are called monomers. They will be able to be absorbed by the mucosal cells. Then the proteins are multiple amino acids bound by peptide bonds. They are referred to as polypeptides. So uh, amino uh, proteins is a chain of amino acids, which is referred to as polypeptide chains. So these polypeptide chains, they need to be broken down by enzyme into amino acids. And those amino acids are the monomers that would be absorbed by the mucosa or the GIT. So they are broken down to form tri dipeptides. Then the smallest units are called amino acids. So the polysaccharides will be broken down into tri peptides or dipeptides. And these now will be broken down by brush border enzymes into amino acids. And the amino acids will be absorbed. 
So lipids are made up of three fatty acids and glycerol molecule to form triglycerides. So lipids are triglycerides. Of course, they also have different special types of lipids like cholesterol esters. So those are also considered as lipids, a special type of lipid. But the majority of them will form triglycerides, meaning that there are three fatty acid chains that are connecting to the glycerol molecule. A glycerol molecule has got a three carbon backbone. Then on each carbon, you have attachment of a fatty acid for the formation of triglycerides. So during lipid digestion, you need to break out the same fatty acids so that you have free fatty acids and mono, mono, monoglycerides, or maybe you have fatty acids, free fatty acids, and the glycerol molecule itself. So that's the digestion that is taking place there. So the bonds that bind these units are broken down by specific enzymes. So in the GIT, there are specific enzymes that are responsible for digestion of these food substances that we are consuming. This table is just summarizing different types of digestion that is taking place in the GIT, okay, with regard to different segments of the GIT. So the first one here is the digestion of carbohydrates. So the carbohydrate digestion. So in the oral cavity, the pharynx and esophagus, we have the digestion of carbohydrates. How? It's because in saliva, we said we have saliva amylase, which is the alpha amylase. The other name for the saliva amylase, we say it's called tylin, is the one that we initiate the digestion of carbohydrates. So the polysaccharides and the disaccharides will be digested into small polysaccharides and maltose is an example. Maltose is an example of a disaccharide. So that is as a result of digestion of larger molecules of uh, carbohydrates. So by the saliva amylase in the, in the oral cavity. So the saliva amylase is part of saliva. So the digestion of carbohydrates will be initiated within the oral cavity but food doesn't spend much time in the oral cavity. You don't spend much time chewing and swallowing. So you find that within uh, two seconds or less, you, you, you've already swallowed what you're chewing. So that digestion is not complete, it's just partial. But when it gets to the stomach, the digestion of carbohydrates will stop. Why? It's because we said in the stomach, there is a lot of hydrochloric acid that will, that will denature the enzymes. So you find that the saliva amylase now won't be that active in the stomach. Why? It's because the, the saliva amylase operate well at alkaline, alkaline environment or slightly acidic, not very acidic like the hydrochloric acid that is giving the pH of the stomach to be 1.5 to about somewhere three. That is too acidic for the saliva amylase. But it's not right for me to say that there is completely no digestion of carbohydrates in the stomach. Why? It's because when you swallow the bolus, there is still some active amylase that is at the center of the bolus that is not being exposed to the hydrochloric acid. So surrounding the bolus, of course, all the saliva amylase will be deactivated to some extent because of the hydrochloric acid. But at the end of the bolus, the digestion of carbohydrates can continue and it will be responsible for about 10 to 30% of carbohydrate digestion in the stomach. So even in the stomach, there's a bit of carbohydrate digestion. Why? It's because of, we can still have active saliva amylase at the center of the bolus that is not yet exposed to the hydrochloric acid. But after those mixing, contraction, churning by the stomach, then the bolus will be converted into chyme, which is semi-liquid. So once the bolus has been mixed with the hydrochloric acid or gastric secretions, then all the saliva amylase will stop because now they are all exposed to the hydrochloric acid. Then you know to say after the stomach, there is little of carbohydrate digestion taking place there. The reasons that I've already explained then there will be emptying of gastric content into the duodenum, gastric emptying. So the chyme now is moving into the duodenum, which is a small intestine. 
So in the lumen of the small intestine, there's a lot of digestion of carbohydrates that is taking place there. So the polysaccharides, the small polysaccharides or large polysaccharides, they will be worked on by pancreatic amylase. So we have the pancreas that is also releasing some enzymes. And one of the enzymes is pancreatic amylase that is very active in digestion of carbohydrates. So the polysaccharides will be digested into maltose and other disaccharides. And these disaccharides within the lumen of the small intestines, we have the brush border enzymes. The brush border enzymes are enzymes that are provided by the mucosal cells of the intestine. So they are part of intestinal secretions. So we have these brush border enzymes that will finish the digestion of carbohydrates. So now the disaccharides will be digested into monosaccharides and the monosaccharides will be absorbed by the mucosal cells. So this is just a summary of carbohydrate metabolism, uh, digestion, not metabolism. Then we have protein digestion. Protein digestion in the oral cavity, we don't have much enzymes that can work on protein. So there is very little or no digestion that is taking place in the oral cavity. Proteins are not being digested there. There are no specific enzymes for proteins. But once the bolus move to the stomach, in the stomach, we know to say we have gastric secretions that contain pepsin. So there's pepsinogen that is converted into pepsin by the hydrochloric acid. Then you have auto-activation, uh, information that we already shared in the previous lecture. So now the pepsin will start the digestion of proteins. So you can see we have these large proteins that will be digested by pepsin and then it will be converted into small peptides. Then the small peptides, they will move to the small intestines during gastric emptying. Then we have these peptides or small peptides that will be worked on by pancreatic trypsin. So you have trypsin and chymotrypsin. These are the two enzymes that are also coming from the pancreas. So these enzymes, they work on the proteins. So they'll convert the polypeptide into the smaller peptides. Then we also have pancreatic carboxypeptidase. So the pancreatic carboxypeptidase, it will remove the amino acid on the carboxyl end of the protein. So the protein has got the carboxyl end and then it has got the amino end. So on the carboxyl end of the protein, these uh, pancreatic carboxypeptidase, they'll be able to remove some amino acids. Then you can see that you have these amino acids and the remaining small peptides, they'll be worked on by brush border enzyme. So the brush border enzyme of the small intestines, we have the dipeptidase that will split two amino acids that are attached by a peptide bond. So it will split the two amino acids into amino acids. So we have these dipeptide, uh, dipeptidase that are responsible for that. We have carboxypeptidase, the carboxypeptidase, and they are also part of the brush border enzymes that will finish the digestion of amino acids. And then you have amino peptidase. So these are the brush border enzymes that will finish the digestion of proteins into amino acids, and then the amino acids are smaller monomers that can be absorbed by the mucosa cells. Nucleic acid digestion, nucleic acid, you're talking of DNA and RNA. So RNA and DNA digestion. So the main enzymes that are involved in DNA and the RNA digestion, they are coming from the pancreas. Remember, we have pancreatic nucleases, so deox nucleases, endonucleases, and um, some nucleases. So these nucleases are responsible to digest DNA and RNA into nucleotides. And the nucleotides, they are going to be digested by nucleotides. So the nucleotides, these are brush border enzymes as well. They are being secreted by the epithelium, the mucosal cells of the small intestine. So you have a lot of these nucleo, nucleotides and nucleosides. So the nucleosides and phosphatase, they are responsible to finish up the digestion of DNA. So we say that the DNA, RNA, they will be converted into nucleotides. Then the nucleotides will be worked on by nucleotides into nucleosides. The nucleosides 
will be worked on by nucleosides and phosphates into nitrogenous bases, sugars, and phosphates. And these monomers will be absorbed by the mucosal cells. Fat digestion, there is very little of fat digestion taking place in the oral cavity. Mainly there is just uh, mechanical digestion or physical digestion by the teeth. Then in, this, in the stomach, you have less or very little of uh, fat digestion because we have a bit of gastric lipase that can start digestion of fat in the stomach. But the quantity of gastric lipase is not that much and it's not very active. So certain textbooks won't mention any digestion that is taking place within the stomach. But in the small intestines, that's where you have much of fat digestion or lipid digestion. Why? It's because you need the bowel salts. So remember, the liver is producing the bowel acids. Then these bowel acids, once they are transported into the small intestines, they'll be worked on by a certain bacteria. They will be converted into bowel salts. And the bowel salts will cause emulsification of fat. So large fat globules will be broken down into small fat droplets, exposing the site that can be worked on by pancreatic lipase and also certain lipase that are being produced within the pancreas. So we have a lot of uh, pancreatic lipase that is responsible for the digestion of fat. So you can see in this diagram that in the small intestines, we have the fat globules that will be worked on by bowel salts. Then they will be converted into fat droplets. The fat droplets now, the sites where a lipase is supposed to go and break down, it's being exposed now. So the pancreatic lipase will be able to gain access to those sites where it's going to break them down into grease molecules, fatty acids, and glycerides. So these now will be absorbed by the lactules. So you know to say fat products are not being transported by hepatic portal vein to the liver, but it will be transported by the lymphatic system back to the cardiovascular system, okay? So this is basically the summary of what we are discussing today. So without wasting much time, let's add a few information to each type of food particle that you are eating, starting with carbohydrates. So the largest polysaccharides include starch, glycogen, and cellulose. So we don't have the enzymes that are responsible for digestion of cellulose, but other animals, they do have the enzymes that are responsible for digestion of cellulose. That's why they eat a lot of glass. But you know, human beings, we don't eat a lot of glass, so it means there is no need for us to have this enzyme. Otherwise, we have also other enzymes that are responsible for digestion of, of carbohydrates. So other smaller forms include disaccharides. So disaccharides is a combination of two monomers or two monosaccharides. So if you combine two monosaccharides, we are going to have disaccharides. So examples of these disaccharides are sucrose, lactose, and maltose and the smallest uh, monosaccharides. The monosaccharides is just composed of one monomer. So these monomers, they could be fractose, galactose, and glucose. So the combination of these monomers will form the disaccharides, okay? So if you have two glucose combining, you will have maltose. If the galactose is combining with the glucose, you're going to have lactose. If fructose is combining with glucose, you're going to have sucrose. So you know the disaccharides and the monosaccharides. So the digestion of carbohydrates, I've already mentioned to say starting in the oral cavity. So we have the tylin or the alpha myelase, which is an enzyme secreted by saliva glands that will break down polysaccharides to maltose. So a maltose is a disaccharide. So it's responsible for 5% of carbohydrate digestion. So 5% of carbohydrate digestion is taking place within the oral cavity by the alpha amylase. So this breakdown continues in the middle of the bolus in the stomach and conversion of further 30 to 40% is noted. So like I said, 
in as much as the bolus is moving into the stomach, the stomach is going to denature the enzyme or is going to provide that environment that is not conducive for the tylene enzyme. But we still have the tylene enzyme or the saliva amylase that is at the center of the bolus that will continue digesting the carbohydrates within the stomach. So it's not accurate to say that in the stomach there's absolutely no carbohydrate digestion. Carbohydrate digestion can continue at the center of the bolus. Okay, so this is a summary of carbohydrate digestion, just an overview. So in the mouth or oral cavity, we have saliva amylase. In the stomach, we have no enzymes, but at the center of the bolus, like I have already explained to say, the digestion of carbohydrates will continue. Then we have the, the pancreas, we have pancreatic alpha myelins, and also in the intestine, in the intestine, you have different types of brush border enzyme. So you can see we have uh, dextrinase that is responsible to digest alpha dextrin. So you have dextrin that can be digested by dextrinase. And then maltase is responsible to digest maltose. Then you have isomaltase that is responsible just to move uh, certain molecules from one compound to another compound. Then we have sucrose that is responsible for digestion of sucrose. And then lactase is responsible for digestion of lactose. Okay. Okay, so this is just a breakdown of carbohydrates. So you can see the different types of carbohydrates, monosaccharides, which are the smallest uh, monomers or unit of carbohydrates, disaccharides. If you combine two uh, monomers, oligosaccharides, polysaccharides, these are large, large carbohydrates molecules or compounds. This is also a summary of carbohydrate digestion and the enzymes. So here you can see the brush border enzymes that are responsible to finish up the digestion. So the area where carbohydrate is being digested, the enzymes responsible, the substrate and the end product. So in the mouth, you have saliva that contains saliva amylase. They are working on the polysaccharides, cooked starch to digest it into disaccharides like maltose. Then in the stomach, we have a bit of gastric amylase. So I said, this is a very weak uh, enzyme. So you find that the action is negligible. The action of this uh, enzyme is negligible. So we'll say that there's not much of carbohydrate digestion taking place in the stomach. In the small intestines, of course, this is where you find brush border enzymes. So to start with, you have pancreatic amylase that will continue the digestion of polysaccharides into disaccharides, dextrin, and also maltose. But we have the brush border enzymes that will finish up the digestion of carbohydrates. So the sucrase will work on sucrose to convert it into glucose and uh, fractose. The maltase will work on maltose to convert it into glucose, two molecules of glucose. Then we have the lactase that work on lactose to convert it into glucose and galactose. So these are the monomers that will be absorbed. Okay, so again, if you didn't understand, in small intestines, we have pancreatic amylase that will break down the remaining polysaccharides into maltose and other smaller polymers. Then the epithelium enzymes are present to break down these smaller polymers into now the monomers. So like I already explained to so say we have lactase that is breaking down lactose to give you galactose and glucose. Sucrase is going to break it down to give you sucrose. I mean, uh, the sucrase is going to break down sucrose to give you fructose and galactose. Then the maltase is broken, it's going to break down maltose to give you two molecules of glucose. So it's just basically one and the same information. Even here is basically one and the same information. So we make progress for the sake of time. So let's look at now the final absorption of carbohydrates. So this diagram is just summarizing the final digestion of carbohydrates and the absorption that is taking place. So these are the brush border enzymes that are found on the apical side of the mucosal cells. So those mucosal cells, 
they have brush border enzymes attached to them. And at the same time, they have the channels that are responsible for absorption of the monomers that are coming from carbohydrate digestion. So <clears throat> on this apical side of the membrane, we have the lactase that will break down the lactose. So it has got a site where lactose can go and bind, then the enzyme will break it down into glucose and galactose. So these are the monomers. They are small enough, they'll be transported by sodium glucose transporter one. So you can see the sodium glucose transporter one, which is an example of secondary active transport, whereby the movement of sodium, the energy that is derived from the movement of sodium is going to be used to move another uh, substance against the electrochemical gradient. So this qualifies to be secondary active transport. So sodium, the transportation of glucose and galactose requires sodium. So this is an example of secondary active transport. So these mucosal cells now, they will internalize the glucose, the galactose, and the sodium. Then on the basolateral side of the membrane, you have other channels that are responsible for overall absorption of sodium and galactose. So I'll explain in the next slide. So this is just the apical side of the membrane. Then we have this brush border enzyme, the sucrase, that is responsible to break down sucrose. Then the sucrose is being broken down into fractose and glucose. The glucose is still being transported by sodium glucose transporter protein one, but the fractose is being internalized by another ion channel. So we have the ion channel or carrier. This is not a pump, it's not using energy. It's just allowing the movement of fractose. So it's facilitating the diffusion of fractose. So this is facilitated movement of fractose into the cells. They are called the GUT5 channels. So GUT5 channel. The GUT5 channels are the ones that are responsible for absorption of fractose. Then you can also see we have the alpha dextrinase that is responsible to digest alpha limit dextrins. So dextrins is a smaller uh, polypeptide. So this smaller polypeptide, they'll be broken down by alpha dextrinase, which is also an example of brush water enzyme into a lot of glucose. And then this glucose, of course, it will be transported by sodium glucose transporter protein one. Then we have glucoamylase that is also responsible for digestion of other smaller pept, uh, smaller polysaccharides. So we have polysaccharides. So polysaccharides like malto oligosaccharides, they will be digested by the glucoamylase. And of course, we have maltose, which is not shown here. And the maltose is being digested by maltase. So maltase is a brush border enzyme that will break down maltose into two molecules of glucose. And those glucose will still be internalized by the sodium glucose transporter protein one, coupled with the movement of sodium. Okay, so we make progress. The principle of absorption, so the fluid absorbed in a day, we say that it's equal to the fluid that is ingested per day, two liters, plus the fluid that is being secreted by the intestine or the GIT itself. So two plus seven to give you nine. But this amount of fluid that you're losing in the fecal material, we said it's just 100 mules or 0 0.1 liter, which is not much. So stomach has poor absorption ability. So in the stomach, you don't have much of absorption taking place there. But there are certain chemicals that can be absorbed there. Okay, examples have been given there. Alcohol, so some of the alcohol can be absorbed within the stomach and certain drugs like aspirin. So aspirin is one of the drugs that can be absorbed in the stomach. When you start looking at Pharmacology, you will come back to this and you will see the effect of aspirin and alcohol. And it's very, very acute because digestion of these substances, they are taking place also in the stomach. 
So this is due to lack of villi and presence of tight junctions in the epithelium. So epithelium of the stomach has got a lot of tight junctions to prevent movement, paracellular movement of these substances. Then we don't have a lot of microvilli or villi, finger-like projections in the, in the stomach. So there'll be less surface area for absorption to take place in the stomach. That means that there'll be less absorption that is taking place in the stomach. Then the small intestines, they have the microvilli. So they do have the villi, which are the finger-like projections. And on those finger-like projections, we have hair-like structures, which are called microvilli. So these are the ones that will increase the absorption of whatever is being digested there. So we have the brush border, which are called the microvilli. They are the same ones that will contain enzyme for digestion, to finish digestion of most of these molecules that you are consuming. Then water movement obeys the law of osmosis. So water will always just obey law of osmosis because we can have a bit of aquaporins. Then we can also have a paracellular movement of water and electrolytes. So they will just obey the law of osmosis. They will start just moving from a region where there is low water potential. I mean, from a region where there is high water potential to a region where there is low water potential. So that is just osmosis. So it's just the movement of water molecules, maybe from less concentrated uh, region to a more concentrated region in terms of the solute concentration. Remember when we are defining osmosis, we defined it in two ways. We said that osmosis is the movement of water molecules from low solute concentration to high solute concentration through a semi-permeable uh, membrane. Then we also said osmosis is the movement of water molecules from a region of high water concentration to a region of low water concentration via a semi-permeable membrane. So you can define it based on water molecules or you can define it based on solute concentration. So I still, I, I hope you still remember that. Then ions, they use different mechanism that are noted for ion absorption. So these ions, they're using different mechanisms. So you have ion pumps, ion channels that are responsible for absorption of ions. But the absorption of carbohydrates to some extent I've explained a bit. So we only have well, less than two minutes. So once Zoom cut us, you just have to rejoin using the same link, okay? And then we'll just discuss maybe for the next 10 minutes or so, we'll end there. So mostly absorbed are monosaccharides. So the monosaccharides that are being absorbed here is by secondary active transport, of which I explained to say the absorption of glucose and galactose, they use sodium potassium, I mean, uh, sodium glucose co-transporter proteins. So you have sodium glucose transporter one that is responsible for absorption of glucose and galactose. So sodium from the cytos of epithelial cell is actively taken out. So it's actively taken into blood, repeating the cytosolic sodium content. So the sodium that is being internalized together with glucose and lactose, it will be pumped out by sodium potassium ATPS pump. So the sodium potassium ATPS pump is the one that is going to pump out the sodium to reduce the concentration. And that will enhance the internalization of the same sodium and other molecules like glucose and lactose. So let me just explain from the diagram, you'll be able to understand. So this is absorption of carbohydrates. So I said carbohydrates, they are being absorbed as monomers. So the monomers, you have glucose, lactose, and fructose. So glucose and lactose, they are using sodium, glucose,